Good afternoon, Club 17. Great to be together again. And we have a really fascinating program today with two great speakers. We've got uh, Alicia Kintner, who is the president and CEO of ArtsWave. I know a number of people here know Alicia. And we have John Morris Russell from the Cincinnati Pops Orchestra, the conductor. Wonderful to have him here again, because I know, John, that you've been here before. Uh, when you first uh, came into that job. So great to, ha great to have you here. We're going to start today with some music. We're going to start with the Star Spangled Banner. If you could turn toward the flag, we'll watch a video. At this time, we request that you please remove your hats or render a salute if you're a veteran of the United States military as we pay respect to our flag and honor America with a performance of our national anthem by Grammy Award winner, and lifelong Royals fan, Kansas City's very own international operatic superstar, Joyce D. Donato. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight all the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming I think we need to get her in Cincinnati. What do you think? Maybe with the pops. Good, 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 good. So uh, now we're going to have our invocation uh, led by Dan Long. Let's pray. Thank you, President Brett. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Creator and sustainer of all that is or ever will be, Accept our thanks for this day and all its blessings. We ask that you guide and direct our club, its leaders, and our actions. Grant that each of us may feel a responsibility to Rotary and to our community, to our country, indeed all countries and peoples. Bless our fellowship today and bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. In your service, amen. And now the four, the four way test for the things we think, do, and say. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Please be seated. And now Tim Hirschner is gonna introduce our guest today and we're always excited to have guests join us. Thank you, President Brett. Uh, I'd first like to welcome John. Uh, we, we, we love to see you here. And, and I thought you got the memo about the red jacket. Well, you got it. 
Anyways, um, we're happy to uh, welcome two guests today. Our first guest is Chuck Martz. Um, he's uh, by way of Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, coming to Cincinnati uh, with Blue Arch. He's in the marketing business. Uh, talk to him to find out what all he's doing here in Cincinnati. Um, he was uh, the Phoenixville Club's past president, so welcome, Chuck. And then our second guest is our very own uh, Judy DeVoid's daughter, Grace DeVoid. Welcome today. And that's it. Have a good morning. And we've got a few announcements today. And first of all, just a reminder, when you're finished eating, if you could put your mask back on, we want to be good about following all the right protocols. And we have several birthdays to celebrate this week. Uh, yesterday, Paula Ash. Today, Sam Schutte. Uh, September 20th, Kathy Machinga and Mackenzie Bennett. And September 21st, we hit the jackpot. Pete Armstrong, Scott Hoberg, and Jordan Finley. Please join me in wishing them a happy birthday. And you all know that uh, Believe to Achieve 2020 is underway right now. It's a virtual edition, and you can support children and adults with disabilities who are getting help from three local agencies. And it's really important that we keep our participation as a Rotary Club to support these three wonderful organizations. Uh, there is really a, in a kind of the the key event of this whole thing is this Saturday the 19th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. called the Believe to Achieve Hour of Power. I like that title, really good. And there'll be a demonstration by Molly Wellman on making cocktails. Josh Sneed, a wonderful comedian, will be part of emceeing the event online. And of course, Teddy Kramer will be there, the Reds bat boy. Uh, it's going to be a great event. Please uh, join Saturday at 5.30, and all the information you need is actually in E-Rays already, but I think right on the uh, screen there, that is the sign-on uh, website. So if you sign on to that website, again, you can just go to E-Rays, and you've gotten one or two other mail uh, emails from both Linda Muth and John Farmeyer. Uh, you'll have all you need. It's very easy to sign on and very easy to bid. We've got some wonderful silent auction and regular auction gifts. So big encouragement and really crucial to, as a Rotary Club to help fund these three organizations who have gone through a lot in the pandemic and they are really providing service to families and definitely need the help. So thank you. And speaking of uh, thank yous, uh, a big thank you to the six members of our club who dedicated their Saturday evening, September 12th, to helping at the WCET Action Auction. And I know I saw a lot of social media posts, including one of Jim Crowley and Carl Kappas, watching over the very expensive bottles of wine that were being auctioned off, and that made me a little nervous, actually, to see those two there. Uh, but a big thanks also to Shirley Love, Galen Gordon, Jeff Weir, and Bill Stilley. And speaking of service, <laughs> speaking of service opportunities, uh, you know as a club we've been very engaged. Uh, as President Dave uh, really led us through the, the first few months of COVID-19, we did a number of key service projects to help the community. We've kept that going uh, this Rotary year. Uh, just a, a good string of events and service opportunities to help our community. Here's, here's a new one for your attention, and think about this. Our club has a service opportunity to help on an ongoing basis with the provision of fresh fruits and vegetables to one or more neighborhood sites in Cincinnati. And this is to address food deserts where access to fresh produce is scarce. Uh, if you're willing to commit on a once a month or more frequent basis with the transport and or distribution of fruits and vegetables, please email Bill Stilley or Pat Neal Miller 
of our hands-on service committee. And you'll see that information right in E-Raise this week in terms of their emails. Depending on how many Rotarians are willing to commit, we'll decide as a club if and how it makes sense to proceed. So thank you. And members in the news, congratulations to Rotarians Rob Ballot and Heather Hawkins. Their law firm, Taft Statinius, ranks among the 60 best law firms for women in the US. And please keep fellow Rotarian Hans Popke in your thoughts and prayers. Hans fell on Saturday, September 12th and fractured his hip. He had, he had surgery at Christ Hospital and was recovering there. It was successful, the, the operation, but he's still in, in pain and discomfort. I think he was supposed to be released from the hospital yesterday to go back home for recovery and get physical therapy. So please uh, think about sending him a card or wishing him well. I know he'd appreciate it. And just a quick heads up about our Rotary meeting next Thursday. Our speaker will be Anthony Munoz. Uh, Anthony, of course, is the founder of the Anthony Munoz Foundation, which does wonderful work. And, if, and we all know Anthony is a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame and also a member of the NFL 100 all-time team. So that'll be a great program and it'd be great to, to have him here. And now I'd like to switch gears and introduce Alicia Kettner. And Alicia, as I said, is the president and CEO of Artswave. A number of people here know Alicia. She was recruited to join Artswave in Cincinnati in 2013. And in September 2014, she became the chief executive officer. And her words, a role she feels she's been preparing for her whole life. And prior to relocating to Cincinnati from the Northeast, she served as deputy, deputy director of the Greater Hartford Arts Council for a decade. And she doubled the size of the annual community arts campaign. And she also helped to consolidate the functions of the city's downtown business council and beautification programs into the arts council in order to maximize civic resources and leverage community assets. And in addition to all of that, which is a lot, Alicia also had professional experiences as Vice President for Advancement at the Connecticut Science Center and the Development Director at New York's Dance Theater Workshop and also as a dance writer for the Moscow Times in Russia. So Alicia, we're so glad to have you visit today and to speak to us. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Brett, and hello to all of you. It's a pleasure to be out and about and having lunch with friends. It feels like it's a long time since, since we've been doing that regularly, and hats off to the Rotary Club for continuing the, the tradition. Uh, it's also wonderful to be able to talk for a few moments about the arts. Artswave is Greater Cincinnati's engine for the arts, and with the help of tens of thousands of donors, every year we're able to invest in more than 100 arts organizations and activities that are using the arts to build a more vibrant region, regional economy and a more connected community. When the ban on mass public gatherings went down in mid-March from Governor DeWine, the lights went out on the arts in Cincinnati. And since then, more than 4,000 live arts activities and experiences have been canceled or postponed. It's really ironic to think that the events, uh, the crises of 2020 have meant that the superpower of the arts to bring us together as a community um, has really been tested and, and in some ways dimmed, at least temporarily. With the ban on live arts went a total stoppage of earned revenue, what we call box office sales, ticket sales, which for most arts organizations are anywhere from 40 to 70% of their operating budgets. So right away, there was a, a total stop of revenue coming in for organizations. 
It was also the end of government contracts for a number of arts and cultural organizations which provide specialized services for a lot of populations in our community in great need. And it was the end of teaching contracts for artists in our public schools because, of course, schools closed as well. So total disruption to the arts industry as we know it. And we estimate that losses, which continue to incur, are over $40 million locally at this time and uh, exponentially more statewide. In fact, the state of Ohio estimates that the arts and entertainment industry has the highest percentage of unemployment right now of all industry groups at 47%. That's 20 percentage points higher than the next largest industry group of people unemployed right now, which is leisure and hospitality at 30%. Nationally, it's a big problem too. Americans for the Arts estimates that two-thirds of American artists are unemployed right now. There is really a lot at stake. We've been getting guidance recently about how to restart, and of course, that's the good news. And earlier this summer, in fact, our museums were able to reopen and uh, welcome people in, um, in numbers that have pleased even the museums who were optimistic. People want to come back inside our arts venues, so that's the good news. We've also recently received guidance from the state uh, for the first time about how live performances can resume. But unfortunately, the restrictions caused by the rapid transmission of this disease mean that audience sizes are gonna continue to be really limited for the foreseeable future. And that calls into question the financial viability of putting a live arts performance on stage, particularly for our theaters. Our theaters, um, you know, our professional theaters, whether it's the Playhouse in the Park or the Warsaw Federal Incline Theater on the West Side or Ensemble Theater, um, they have ex incredibly high percentages of earned revenue dependence on box office sales, which in better times is a real virtue. They are really struggling now, and under the current guidelines for returning to theater at Ensemble, if you can picture the beautiful new Ensemble Theater, that would mean just 27 people in the audience. So we have a long-term challenge for restarting the arts. Fortunately, Cincinnati is an incredibly generous community, and, and you all embody that history of service and generosity. And this year, the 2020 Arts Wave campaign uh, had a goal of $12.4 million. We extended the campaign through the summer a little longer than we normally go. And thanks to everyone in this room and the entire community, we got as far as $10.8 million, which is an incredible outcome for this year and says so much about what Cincinnati values. Um, we also, at ArtsWave, started an Arts Vibrancy Recovery Fund and plan because we could see that this business disruption was going to require some different kinds of thinking and some additional generosity by the com community. And so we put a two for one match from our endowment on the table that for every contribution to this Arts Vibrancy Recovery Fund, we would match it with $2 for our endowment. We wanted to raise $1 million, match it with $2 million for a $3 million restart fund. And I'm really pleased to say that as of today, we're at about 920000 toward that million dollar goal. So that is an opportunity. But we said we can't just think about restarting in exactly the same way. So our plan has four important components, which really reflect the spirit of our community and the collaborative nature of the arts organizations that call Cincinnati home. Of course, the first priority is to sustain our assets that are at great risk right now. The second priority is to think about smart restructuring. How can we pull some shared services together, some things behind the scenes, reimagine some smaller organizations perhaps, and make really good use of our resources? The third thing that we must do as a community is ensure cultural diversity. And certainly, events of 2020 have underscored uh, the urgency around 
increasing resources for uh, those people who have been marginalized and under-resourced for so long. So we have a whole initiative around diversity, inclusion, equity, and access. And how can we invest more as a community in people of color and in multiple artistic and cultural traditions? And the fourth thing our plan and Arts Vibrancy Recovery Fund must do is enable innovation. The future is going to look different than the past, we know that, and our arts organizations have to be inclusive, relevant, and innovative to meet the needs of audiences like you and audiences that come out when eventually we can retake the stage. And we're so excited to see arts organizations of all sizes and types in Cincinnati doing really innovative things right now to transfer their work to the digital space, for instance or to take performances outside. Cincinnati Shakespeare Company recently did a drive up production at Union Terminal, as an example. We're seeing a lot of innovation and creative thinking, and that's good, that's exciting. Eventually, we will come together around some of these new ideas. So we have to make room for experimentation. The corporate world does this really well, right? They have R&D teams, right? They spend a lot of money experimenting. It's something the nonprofit arts rarely have the luxury to do. So we have time right now, and we have to make resources available for that important work to set us up for the next many decades of impact in greater Cincinnati. So thank you for your support of ArtsWave. Thank you for making the arts the important priority that they are in greater Cincinnati. And let's work together to make the impact of the arts restart just as soon as possible. Alicia, thank you so much for that really helpful update, and we, we appreciate it. We understand just how tough it is to go through the adjustment this community has to go through, every community does. And now uh, I'd like to introduce John Morris Russell, and I know a number of people here know John already. Uh, he's got a, a long bio, and, uh, and a very interesting one. Uh, if you think about the fact that he has now been here, is it 10 years? 10 year, uh, 10 year anniversary with Cincinnati Pops. Uh, he has really devoted himself to redefining American orchestral experience. And he has been a conductor, collaborator, and educator to, who has reinvigorated the musical scene in Cincinnati, but also throughout North America. Uh, in addition to his role he, here, he's the music director of the Hilton Head Symphony and South Carolina, and he leads the Hilton Head International Piano Competition. Uh, he also serves as principal pops conductor of the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra, following in the footsteps of Marvin Hamlish and Doc Severinsen, two big names we all know. And as a guest conductor, he has worked with many of the most distinguished orchestras in North America, including Los Angeles Philharmonic, Cleveland Orchestra, New York Philharmonic, Boston Pops, National Symphony, and the orchestras of Toronto, Vancouver, Dallas, Detroit, and Pittsburgh. So with the Cincinnati Pops, Mr. Russell leads sold out performances at Music Hall in normal times, in the normal times, as well as having done a number of domestic and international tours, including one to China and Taiwan in 2017, and he actually returned to China in 2019 for a concert series there with uh, one of their orchestras. So he's a visionary leader, and he has done a lot uh, for Cincinnati and a lot for the arts. Uh, he is the creator of what's called the American Originals Project, and that has gotten both popular and critical acclaim. Uh, he has two landmark recordings with that. One is the American Originals Music of Stephen Foster, as well as an American Originals 1918, which won a Grammy nomination last year. And in 2020, just to show that he is broad in his reach and experience, he has continued to work in, in projects including with King Records and the Cincinnati Sound, 
collaborating with a person many of us know, Paul Schaefer of the David Letterman Show, Late Show, uh, and he's been celebrating the beginnings of bluegrass, country, soul, and funk music, and rockabilly. And uh, a lot of these uh, musical entities or identities or genres are recorded right here in the Queen City if you look at Cincinnati history. So it's a wonderful thing to capture that. So he's done more collaborations than I can read. And uh, I won't even read you the list of all of them. But I, I will read a list of some of the artists that he's worked with. He has uh, worked with Aretha Franklin, Emmanuel Axe, Amy Grant and Vince Gill. Uh, also worked with uh, My Michael McDonald, John Kimura Parker, George Takai, and uh, Steve Martin, Catherine McPhee, Brian Wilson, and Leslie Odom Jr. So that's a, a long list of engagements and accomplishments, and please join me in welcoming John back to Cincinnati Rotary. There you go. Thanks, everybody. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, here I'm going to add, this is a great thing about get a mask that fits, and it just, and it, it can be a fashion statement. And there we go. <laughs> We're going to figure that out. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, and thank you for the, for the splendid introduction. I think I've got about five minutes now to talk to everyone. It's fantastic. Um, uh, it's rather interesting that, that, that you mentioned the, the concert, the American Originals concert that we did with Paul Schaefer uh, and the Pops. We did that the first weekend in March and three sold out shows. We had fantastic singers, all new arrangements. Uh, I mean, it was, it was, well, literally, it was like rock and roll. We were all on stage, just thrilled, you know, thinking, how is it gonna get any better than this? And it was only like five days later that we completely shut down. That was the last live concert that we performed at Music Hall. And right now it just seems like just an incredibly distant memory. Um, uh, it, it was a really good one to, to go out with a bang, let me tell you. Um, uh, but in so many ways, it was from that point that we had to kind of really rethink everything. And uh, Alicia, I, I loved uh, uh, your talk. And I, I guess it comes as, as no surprise that when you talked about those four points, that this is what the Cincinnati Symphony uh, and Pops Orchestra um, uh, has been deeply engaged with uh, in the last six months. Um, and I guess, you know, it's kind of nice. We can tell you exactly, you know, how we've taken these ideas and, and put them into action. Um, we are so blessed to be here in Cincinnati in a community uh, where um, uh, corporate uh, and private philanthropy Everyone really gets it, uh, and there are not that many uh, cities that, that, that have this incredible wherewithal and knowledge and um, uh, commitment uh, to the arts. And frankly, this is what has kept Cincinnati going through thick and thin um, for you know, the last 200 some odd years uh, of being right here. And um, so we go to uh, Alicia's first point. Uh, uh, to sustain our arts organizations. Um, and Cincinnati Symphony and Pops Orchestra uh, has done so much work to sustain our orchestra and to sustain our musicians in the orchestra uh, with, as you can imagine, a pretty significant payroll. Um, but the commitment was, was given down by the board and by our supporters that we were going to sustain our musicians through all of this, through thick and thin, as we've done for 125 years. You can imagine, in the last 125 years, there's been a lot of thin. Uh, and lo and behold, the orchestra has always stood by, and it has made our orchestra unique. And when we look like or orchestras of, of um, uh, similar budget sizes, like the Nashville Symphony Orchestra, that furloughed everyone. We look at orchestras across the orchestra that are just shutting down. And you cannot recover uh, uh, at all 
<laughs> uh, uh, if you just shut down. And, and our leadership and our community has come together and, and made that commitment. Um, and our musicians have followed suit by uh, being able to uh, 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 reopen our negotiations so that we can create unique programming uh, for the next several months, maybe for the next year, who knows, um, but has made that commitment to be flexible in the way that we present our concerts uh, and um, uh, the, the, the way that, that we're, our music gets out to the community. So that brings us to uh, Alicia's second point, uh, and that is restructuring. And we have found uh, uh, that because the live music experience, we're not able to do it, but we're gonna figure out and have figured out a way that we can still bring music to people. And uh, over the summer, there's a lot of planning going into this. Most of my time <laughs> was spent during the summer uh, undoing all of the programs that, that we had developed over the last year and a half for our summer programming and fall programming, see how we can make it smaller, more efficient. Uh, I mean, imagine, right? We have an orchestra of 90 some odd musicians that we squeeze onto stage. But now, all of our violinists, all of our string players in the orchestra, all have to be six feet apart from each other. So our crew has developed these, um, uh, the, these really gigantic protractors. <laughs> we figure out how much space each violinist, each string player in our orchestra needs. And then we have wind players, all of the woodwinds, oboe, bassoon, clarinet, and our brass players, trumpet, horn, trombone, tuba. They put air through those instruments. And so those requirements are different. And believe it or not, there have already been like a dozen scientific studies on the aerosol created by woodwind instruments and brass instruments. One of the, which was actually, and is continuing, uh, to be done by uh, University of Cincinnati, CCM. Uh, and we had several uh, acoustic rehearsals over the summer where we had those uh, uh, members of, of this research team from UC come and put up monitors all throughout the rehearsal to find out what the aerosol was for those wind players. And um, uh, the good news is that 12 feet might just be a little excessive, but you're probably gonna need a little bit more room than six feet. And it's impossible to wear a mask while playing the clarinet. <laughs> impossible. Um, uh, and so we are able to fit on stage effectively about 30 players, about one third of our entire uh, orchestra. And imagine everyone is far distant from each other. So um, when, when I'm giving that downbeat, there's all this distance and time and distance and sound, they all kind of work out for the way that at that first rehearsal, it was a mess, let me tell you. But this is one of the brilliant things about working with the greatest musicians in the world, we figured it out. We're gonna science the heck out of this thing. And everyone kind of learned what they had to do, where they had to play a little bit in front of the beat, uh, uh, where they had to really listen much more carefully to those people around you, uh, uh, around them. And um, over the course of the summer, we've kind of developed this idea of how we can play together as an ensemble. Myself as uh, a conductor of the Pops, and same thing with my colleague Louis Langre as music director, we have to figure out pieces of music that work for that type of ensemble. We can't do a Tchaikovsky symphony with 30 players on stage. And so we've had to completely wipe the slate clean and figure out what pieces we can perform that are unique to that performing ensemble. And I tell you what, there is a whole lot of repertoire, there are a whole lot of pieces that we never perform as an orchestra because literally they're too small. But now we can bring those pieces out and to be able to tell um, a, a really amazing and effective story about what that music is all about uh, through uh, our, our presentations, which are now going to be streamed uh, well, throughout the community, across the country, around the world. Uh, our symphony and our pops has always been, uh, uh, we've been very proud of the fact of our national and international reach. I mean, there's a point in time with our uh, 10 million CDs uh, that uh, have been purchased around the, uh, around the world, that a majority of those CDs were purchased from people in Japan, Taiwan, and China. Uh, and now we continue that tradition by being able to have a streamed concert that can reach everyone. And whereas there are orchestras like the Buffalo Philharmonic or the Vienna Philharmonic, um, uh, other orchestras out there that are creating uh, streaming concerts, 
There are always paywalls. But we felt it was exceedingly important that with our symphony and our pops, that our streaming programs were for everyone. There are no paywalls at all. They are absolutely free. So that anyone who, can, um, uh, who wants to find out what's going on in Cincinnati musically, they're going to be able to find out. Um, so our fall plan includes four concerts of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra and three concerts with the Pops. Uh, and these uh, will be streamed. We're going to record them do some editing, and then put them together as a stream throughout the, throughout the fall uh, up till um, uh, the uh, very, very beginning of January. Uh, and we're kind of seeing how things go, as we all are, uh, to see what goes on beyond January. But so we have these seven concerts that we're going to be streaming. We also uh, have a lot of live chamber music that has been happening throughout our community, uh, through community concerts, throughout the entire region where we have small groups and ensembles performing for, um, for, for small uh, groups of people who can gather outside. And these types of concerts continue our very important work um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of outreach. So um, for our uh, POPs programming, we have three programs. Uh, and in fact, I start rehearsing those on Monday. Uh, and for these concerts, they're about an hour in length. Uh, I'll have three rehearsals with our orchestra, and then we will have what we call a capture section. session. Uh, we have made the investment into eight cameras, uh, 100 microphones, uh, and have engaged director, uh, uh, sound engineers, so that we can put together uh, a broadcast um, that although people are not physically sitting in music hall. It can give people the experience of being part of the orchestra. In fact, we're taking it even further. Uh, think about this. You know, normally, we're all set up. The, or the hall, music hall, is all designed for us to perform and to project the sound out into the hall so that uh, all uh, 2,447 people can enjoy the sound of our orchestra. Um, but because we do not have audience members and because all of a sudden we're playing to cameras and microphones, why don't we rethink how we set ourselves up? So literally, for these concerts, for these streaming concerts, we are turning our orchestra upside down. The conductor who's usually sitting there, uh, standing on, on the lip of the stage on the podium, that podium goes all the way to the back of the stage where the percussion and, and the, the brass usually are. Uh, the strings that are usually there in the front, they go way in the back. Uh, uh, the brass is going to be going on the lip of the stage, but everyone is facing upstage. We are facing with our backs to the audience so that all of those cameras, our eight cameras, for every shot that they have the orchestra, not only do they have a shot of the violins playing or a singer or a saxophone player, but they also have the chandelier and the architecture of music hall. This is a view that no one on, <laughs> that no one, practically no one in, in our audience ever gets to see. It's something that we see all the time and take for granted. Um, and so we wanted to turn the cameras around, turn our orchestral setup around, so that through these concerts, not only are we experiencing the orchestra, but we're also experiencing a different viewpoint of our orchestra through cameras and microphones. Um, and in fact, even our, our, our chatter, which is, which is usually me and a microphone between numbers, uh, is, is going to be changed as well. It's going to be kind of talking with our artists and something a little bit more conversational so that we can give all of our, our people who are watching these live streams a feeling of what it's like to be backstage with our orchestra. It's like you were right there on stage with us, which is something unique and very, very special. So our three programs, now that's right, we're gonna be taping the very first one starting this uh, uh, Monday, uh, and that's gonna be a program dedicated to American jazz. Uh, and those of you who know me, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, absolutely devoted 
to uh, America's classical music um, uh, known as jazz. And in fact, our 1918 project, our American Original CD, that uh, won that Grammy nomination, is all about the very, very beginnings of jazz music right after the First World War. And we're going to be moving to kind of the next chapter of that, what happened to, to, to jazz from the jazz age moving forward all the way to the bebop era. So we have everything from Scott Joplin Rags, some of the very, very earliest jazz, the music of James Reese Europe, uh, a composer who you've probably never heard of, but is probably one of the most important American composers uh, uh, out there, um, who, uh, who, who was um, uh, born in um, uh, Alabama, Mobile, Alabama, uh, and uh, moved to New York City and founded a clef club orchestra uh, made up of uh, uh, all of his black musicians, and um, uh, signed up in the First World War for the first all-black regiment in the First World War, the 369th Harlem Hellfighters. And although John Philip Sousa was mar writing marches for everyone else, James Reese Europe was writing ragtime marches uh, that he performed with his ensemble uh, in, in France. I mean, there needs to be a movie made about this guy. I, he's extraordinary. I mean, they were literally fighting the central powers in the trenches during the day. And during the evening, he and his band were playing the jazz clubs at Paris at night. I mean, it's remarkable. Um, and it was said that all of France had, uh, had caught ragtimeitis, thanks to the music of James Reese Europe. Uh, and of course, uh, empowered by this great love affair from the people of, of, uh, of France in particular, uh, James Reese Europe uh, and his band came back to the United States and made the first jazz recordings on Pathé Records uh, and basically changed the face of American music um, and made jazz this great mainstream experience. So we're going to be performing a couple pieces of James Reese Europe on our program. We're also going to be uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of Charlie Parker, the great saxophone player, um, uh, and several arrangements that were, that were made in the 1950s. Uh, a couple of records called Charlie Parker and Strings. Now, to all of the real bebop jazz experts, the ones with the little goatee and you've got the little beret there and you're smoking your cigarettes like this, you know, they always thought that Charlie Parker and Strings were for, was for chumps. You know, everyone said, oh, Charlie Parker's selling out by, by playing with string orchestra. But the amazing thing was that Charlie Parker opened the door to jazz to a white audience that never would have heard this otherwise and changed the world of jazz. And there it was, the string orchestra that played with him were members of the NBC Symphony. Uh, and, and Charlie Parker, who, who was a little hesitant to even go into the recording studio with these guys and then came out with one of the great masterpieces of, um, uh, of, of orchestral and jazz fusion. Well, we're going to be playing the original arrangements from those recording sessions in the 1950s which again is kind of a funky little ensemble that we never would be able to do with a pops program, but that we're able to do in this small and intimate session, uh, uh, small and, and uh, intimate sessions that we're gonna be having. Uh, joining us will be Cheryl Cassidy on the alto saxophone, who is the lead saxophone player of the Diva Jazz Orchestra, America's first and only all women jazz ensemble. She's a spectacular player from Chicago and is gonna be joining us for this. Um, uh, also, we have music of Duke Ellington. We have music by Mary Lou Williams, a name, again, no one's ever heard of her. She was a, a fantastic pianist and arranger, and arranger. She started off doing some work with Earl Father Hines um, and started writing arrangements for the Count Basie Orchestra, uh, as well as other uh, jazz ensembles, uh, uh, Duke Ellington. In fact, she performed as a pianist in the ballroom in Music Hall on numerous occasions. Uh, and she was also a brilliant arranger. She created a work called the Zodiac Suite, which is again, a very obscure piece that has a very nutty orchestration that no one has ever performed uh, in, a, in a live performance. And we're gonna be doing this to bring her music to life uh, and in this opportunity that we have. Um, uh, we also have uh, a fantastic singer, Adia Dobbins, who's going to be joining us. Um, Adia, who sang in our Classical Roots uh, chorus for many, many years, uh, sang a couple solos uh, with us for our Classical Roots projects, and 
an amazing singer, so we're bringing her back to also do some of the great arrangements of Ella Fitzgerald uh, that were arranged by Nelson Riddle for those classic recordings. And again, it's the original arrangements uh, that she's going to be singing with us. So this is how, how we celebrate um, uh, uh, the music of jazz. We also have a Halloween program that we're going to be recording a little later on. Um, but this actually brings me, and I've just got enough time to, to get back to this, to, to back to uh, uh, Alicia's point uh, uh, of, the, of the four pillars of, of how the arts community is moving forward, uh, about sustaining our organizations, about restructuring our organizations, and this is the most important one of all, about the diversity of our organizations and innovation. Um, and diversity is extraordinarily important, especially because for the majority of the history of Music Hall, it has not been a very welcoming place, but at all, for black people in the city. It's not. Um, uh, for, for many, many years, uh, uh, it, it, it was segregated. Uh, the, um, uh, the, when we talk about Springer Auditorium, the main auditorium, um, uh, and all the history and all the performers uh, that had gone there and performed there, uh, before 1960, you could probably count the number of black performers on that stage on, on two hands, and that was it for you know, uh, um, uh, almost 100 years. Uh, and yet, in the North Hall, uh, uh, which used to be Machinery Hall. It was turned into an arena. And, uh, and Ezra Charles fought most of his bouts there in the North Hall of Music Hall. Has anyone ever told that story? <laughs> and the South Hall, which is now the ballroom, was converted into a ballroom where just about every uh, important African-American performer uh, in, in jazz and early rock and roll performed in that ballroom. Oftentimes a segregated audience, but they were there. Uh, and these are the stories that we need to tell about Music Hall, um, that, uh, that, 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 that tell about the story of everything that goes underneath one roof of Music Hall. And, uh, and although I've been very instrumental as conductor, as associate conductor of the orchestra in developing our classical roots programs, uh, which kind of came out of the 2001 civil unrest uh, and social justice movement that's, that happened here in Cincinnati in 2001, we at the orchestra said we have to do something different. And we created a classical roots program, which has been fantastic. Every year we'll, we'll have a, a sellout uh, audience in, in, in music hall. Uh, we've developed all sorts of repertoire that we use in our pops and symphony uh, programs. We've, we've engaged uh, uh, more uh, members of our African-American community in Cincinnati than we ever have. But you know what? In 2020, we figured out that this job is not done. We have just dipped our toes in the water. And to me, this is an extraordinary opportunity because to engage other people, to open the doors, to bring everyone to what we're doing, but also at the same time, for ourselves to open our eyes, our ears, our hearts to repertoire that is out there and stories that are out there that we just haven't known about, or worse yet, have ignored. And this is an opportunity to tell those stories and to tell them through music. And to do this, uh, the, the orchestra has engaged a very important position, um, a director of diversity, equity, and inclusion, a senior management position in our orchestra. Uh, and we haven't, we've, we haven't fulfilled the role here. We are very soon to do it, uh, and it'll be a nationwide search. But we are the only orchestra in the country to do this because it's not just about telling the stories and programming, it's not just um, uh, uh, figuring out uh, ways that we can bring more people uh, 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 of color into our audiences, but the most important thing of all is to change the very fabric of what we do and how we do it, so that everything, our programming and artists, our hiring of orchestra, staff members, uh, our vendors, that everything that we do is reaching out and creating uh, uh, a relevancy for music making in this city that goes so far beyond just our concert productions. And to me, we are, we have so many challenges. I don't have to tell you, we've got so many challenges going on in the city, uh, uh, in, in our country. Um, and as Alicia said, we in the arts are all about making it work, using our creativity to find ways 
to make this a better place. And we're doubling down. I'm just here to tell you that. So, um, uh, gee whiz, I think I've, I've, I've got just enough time here uh, for a couple of questions. Um, and I know that we've got a fantastic audience there on Zoom, so, so please, to our, to our Zoom uh, uh, members of our uh, Rotary who've, who've uh, chimed in, uh, would love to get your questions, so take it away. So for, first, I just want to thank John for that wonderful presentation, and we can take uh, about 10 minutes of questions for John or for Alicia. So, uh, uh, Alicia, I'm going to give you a mic that you can use, and John, you can... Are you going to be the moderator? There we go. Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a, um, a program that's used by many cities called uh, BVA, which stands for Business Volunteers for the Arts. And there's also business lawyers, or I'm sorry, volunteer lawyers for the arts, VLA. And do we do that in Cincinnati? The answer is yes. We do uh, a slightly different variation on the same important theme, which is how to connect business leaders to volunteer opportunities in the arts. And our program at ArtsWave is called Boardway Bound, and it is a, an annual program that um, provides kind of a deep dive into the particular needs um, and business issues surrounding nonprofit arts organizations and concludes with a matchmaking opportunity to get paired with an organization that is looking for board members. So over 10 years, we've graduated about 300 individuals and there are several small arts organizations in the region whose boards are entirely made up of graduates of Boardway Bound. Um, so that's an invitation and opportunity. There are other programs throughout the region that connect business leaders to opportunities in the arts as well. Um, and then you had a second part of the question, didn't you? Oh, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts is another one where, um, for any lawyers in the room, there are instances where arts organizations need pro bono assistance and there is um, a way we, through ArtsWave we can connect organizations to those lawyers. Thanks. Oops, right here. Ah. Okay, so, so that's a very good uh, uh, question. So, so when, when, we, when we go into this, our, our streaming situation, we turn the orchestra around, and the question is, what is the acoustics like? Well, what happens is our hall is designed for the acoustics of the orchestra facing out to the hall so that everyone in every seat gets a really great warm feeling. Um, obviously, when we're turned around, the experience in the hall is much different and less ideal. But on the other hand, we are playing kind of to each other because we have all the towers in, in, in the back of the stage and, so, and everyone's facing into that. So it actually allows us on stage to hear each other much better. And it's really important, especially because we're so far apart from each other, we have to rely on our ears to be able to line up with other players and to be able to hear really clearly what they're doing as opposed to taking all of our sound and pushing it out. And so, as I like to say, we let the microphones do the heavy lifting. So. <laughs> right here. Aha, that's a great question. So the question is, what's the difference between a symphony orchestra and a pops orchestra? Um, uh, essentially, an orchestra is just, you know, a large group of players. You always get, get, get the question of, of what is the difference between a philharmonic orchestra and a symphony orchestra. It's the same. It's just a, it's just a nomenclature. A lot of the difference between a, a symphony or a philharmonic and, and a pops is the repertoire that we perform. Um, uh, and to me, uh, a pops is, is kind of a uniquely American art form. I like to talk about the fact that um, it, it reflects the totality of the American musical experience. So it's everything from uh, 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 blues and jazz and rock and roll and R&B and gospel and Broadway and film music. It's all the music that expresses uh, 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 American, um, the American musical ethos. 
And to do that, though, we have all the exact same instruments as in a symphony orchestra, but more. Because so much of rock and roll, jazz, so much of uh, American music, you have to, uh, um, uh, is propelled by what, what we call in the business a rhythm section. Uh, drums, piano, bass, guitar. You go to any rock and roll band, they're going to have those instruments. You go to a jazz ensemble, they're going to have those instruments. Um, you go to Broadway, most of the time they use those instruments. And so the Pops is exactly the same musicians as the symphony, plus this extra rhythm section that's kind of the heartbeat and um, uh, the, the, the rhythmic infrastructure upon which so much of the music that we perform in the Pops is built. Uh, we got time for one more question. I want it to be a doozy. Four million bricks. Wow, that was a doozy. Uh, my wife, Taya Chepkema, is a board member of Friends of Music Hall that, that uh, uh, sustains Music Hall and its ar architectural integrity. Uh, and she actually spent, <laughs> has spent uh, about a year and a half developing a tour called Beyond the Bricks, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and this tells the story of the construction of Music Hall. And, um, uh, and in fact, part of her talk is about uh, the Irish bricklayers and the hod carriers that would, that would take 20 bricks on their shoulders and go up a scaffolding to build that main building in a year's time. Four million bricks in one year's time. Uh, and it's so make sure to go to the Friends of Music Hall website and sign up for one of those tours. I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm, I have a feeling that, that she might be calling you right now and find out if, if you've got any of those bricks lying around because she's crazy about bricks, let me tell you. <laughs> Good, thanks. Great questions, and thanks to John and Alicia for taking those. We appreciate it. And I know you've each visited with different Rotary clubs over the years. You know that one of the focuses of Rotary International is fighting disease. And in appreciation of you each coming here today to speak, we are going to make donations in your honor to the End Polio Now campaign, our global campaign. So thank you very much. Much appreciated. And, and the other thing that as you each talk today, was really obvious is you are working in very creative ways in a very tough situation that we're all going through as a community to let the arts still be the arts right in the middle of this and to let the people who are gifted in those areas have the opportunities to use those gifts. And we all appreciate that. Um, our theme this Rotary year is Rotary Opens Opportunities, and we've got actually a pin I'd like to give each of you. Thank you for coming. I want to commem commemorate on behalf of our club the great work you each are doing. So I want to thank everybody who came in person today to be part of these wonderful presentations. Uh, I also want to thank everybody who's on Zoom today participating as well. It's wonderful. And again, next week, next Thursday, our speaker is Anthony Munoz. Hope that everybody can join. In the meantime, have a great weekend. Meeting adjourned.